I want to talk to you about Jesus. The 1992 novel, also a 1996 film, The English Patient, is set in Egypt during the Second World War. A married English woman, Catherine, finds herself often alone as her husband pursues a cartographical expedition. She falls in love with an impossibly exotic Hungarian nobleman, Laszlo. Count Laszlo, another cartographer, discovers a wondrous cave. Decorated with prehistoric paintings deep in the Sahara Desert, Laszlo and Catherine fall into a passionate affair. Catherine's husband, sensing the affair, plans a murderous revenge. He puts Catherine in the back seat of his biplane and flies towards Count Laszlo's excavation camp near the famous cave. He tries to land the plane right on Laszlo himself, but the plan catastrophically backfires. Laszlo, the intended target, sustains only minor injuries, but Catherine's badly hurt. We witnessed Laszlo carrying her slowly and lovingly to the prehistoric cave. Now, Laszlo and Catherine face an unspeakable predicament. Catherine's injuries are life-threatening. If she's going to live, Laszlo's going to need to go and find medical help. But that means going to Cairo, and Cairo's three days' walk away. It's a dangerous journey. Even if Laszlo gets there unscathed, there may be no one he can persuade to bring help. And even if all these ifs meet happy whens, there's got to be only a small chance Catherine will still be alive when Laszlo gets back. What are they to do? What are they to do? I want you to think about this predicament as the defining question of our time. I'm suggesting that this story discloses the most important question we face. To explain this, I'm going to transport you from the hot, sweaty conditions of this magnificent luxurious holiday camp and take you to the intimacy and the privacy of Christmas Day. I'm going to conjure up for you three Christmas scenes that I'm guessing will be familiar to many, most, perhaps all people here. Here's the first. The first is your relationship with the most difficult member of your family. Now, of course, I know this is one big happy family and there are no such thing as difficult relationships here. But let's imagine, maybe you've got a friend who's got the most difficult member of their family. Okay, let's say it's your father. Christmas is coming up, but somehow you have no idea what to give your father. Deep down, it feels like your inability to know what present will please your father is symbolic of your lifelong confusion about, about what might truly make your father happy, especially where you're concerned. So in the end, you spend more than you meant to on something you don't really believe he wants, pathetically throwing money at the problem but inwardly cursing yourself because you know that what you're buying isn't the answer. When Christmas comes and your father opens the present, you see in his forced smile and his half-hearted hug of thanks 
that you failed yet again to do something for him that might overcome the chasm between you. Here's a second scene. You have family or friends coming to stay for the Christmas season. You want everything to be perfect for them, and you exchange a flurry of emails about who's going to sleep where and whether it's all right for them to bring the dog. You get into a frenzy of shopping and baking. You're actually a little anxious that you'll forget something or burn something, so the kitchen becomes your empire, and you can't bear for someone to interrupt you. And even on the day itself, you're mostly checking the gravy or reheating the carrots. As you say goodbye to your guests, you hug and say, it's such a shame we never really talked while you were here. And when they finally left, you collapse in a heap, maybe in tears of exhaustion. Here's a third scene. You feel there's something empty or lacking in the cozy Christmas with family and friends, and your heart is breaking for people having a tough time in the cold, in isolation, in poverty, or in grief. So you gather together presents for children of prisoners or turn all your Christmas gifts into vouchers representing your support of a house or a cow or two buffaloes for people who need the resources more than you and your friends do. What do these scenes have in common? I want to suggest to you that they're based on one tiny word. It's the word for. When we care about those for whom Christmas is a tough time, we want to do something for them. When we want our house guests to enjoy their Christmas visit, our impulse is to spend our whole time doing things for them, whether cooking dinner or constantly clearing the house or arranging activities to keep them busy. When we feel our relationship with our father is faltering, our instinct is to do something for him that somehow melts his heart and makes everything all right. And those gestures of four matter because they sum up a whole life in which we try to make relationships better, try to make the world better, try to be better people ourselves by doing things for people. We praise the selflessness of those who spend their lives doing things for people. People still sign letters. Do you remember letters? There are people who still write letters. And people sign those letters, your obedient servant, because we want to tell each other, I'm eager to do things for you. When we feel noble, we hum Art Garfunkel singing, like a bridge of a troubled water, I will lay me down. Presumably, lay me down, presumably, for you to walk over me without getting your dainty feet wet. When we feel romantic, we put on the husky voice and turn into Brian Adams singing, everything I do, I do it for you. It's that same word. It seems that the word that epitomizes being an admirable person, the word that sums up the positive public face of Christianity is for. We cook for, we buy presents for, we offer charity for, all to say we lay ourselves down for. But there's a problem here. All these gestures are generous and kind, and in some cases sacrificial and noble. They're good gestures, warm-hearted, admirable gestures, but somehow they don't go to the heart of the problem. You give your father the gift and the chasm still lies between you. You wear yourself out in showing hospitality, but you've never actually had the conversation with your loved ones. You make fine gestures of charity, but the poor are still strangers to you. 
Four is a fine word, but it doesn't dismantle resentment. It doesn't overcome misunderstanding. It doesn't deal with alienation. It doesn't overcome isolation. Most of all, most of all, four isn't the way God relates to us. God doesn't simply set the world straight for us. God doesn't simply shower us with good things. God doesn't mount up blessings upon us and then get miserable and stroppy when we open them all up and fail to be sufficiently excited or surprised or grateful. For isn't the heart of God. In some ways, we wish it was. We'd love God to make everything happy and surround us with perfect things. When we get cross with God, it's easy to feel God isn't keeping the divine side of the bargain to do things for us now and forever. But God shows us something else. God speaks a rather different word. In Matthew's gospel, the angel says to Joseph, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. In John's gospel, we get a summary statement of what the Christian faith means. The word became flesh and lived with us. It's an unprepossessing little word, but this is the word that lies at the heart of the Christian faith. The word is with. John's gospel says the word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. Without him, not one thing came into being. In other words, before anything else, there was a with the with between God and the Word, or as Christians came to call it, between the Father and the Son. With is the most fundamental thing about God. And then we think about how Jesus concludes His ministry. His very last words in Matthew's Gospel are, Behold, I am with you always. In other words, there will never be a time when I am not with when the book of Revelation describes the final disclosure of God's everlasting destiny, this is what the voice from heaven says. Behold, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be His peoples, and God Himself will be with them. We've stumbled upon the most important word in the Bible the word that describes the heart of God and the nature of God's purpose and destiny for us, and that little word is with. That's what God was in the very beginning. That's what God sought to instill in the creation of all things. That's what God was looking for in making a covenant with Israel. That's what God's coming among us in Jesus was all about. That's what the sending of the Holy Spirit meant. That's what our destiny in the company of God will look like. It's all in that little word, with. God's whole life and action and purpose are shaped to be with us. In a lot of ways, with is harder than for. You can do for without a conversation, without a real relationship, without a genuine shaping of your life to accommodate and incorporate the other. The reason your Christmas present for your father is doomed is not because for is wrong, not because there's anything bad about generosity. It's because the only solution is for you and your father to, to be with each other long enough to hear each other's stories and tease out the countless misunderstandings and hurts that have led your relationship beyond the point of being rescued by the right Christmas present. The reason why you collapse in tears when your Christmas guests have gone home is because the hard work is finding out how you can share the different responsibilities and genuinely be with one another in the kitchen and elsewhere that make the stay of several nights a joy of with rather than a burden of for. What makes attempts at Christmas charity seem a little hollow is not that they're not genuine and helpful and kind, but that what isolated and grieving and impoverished people usually need 
is not gifts or money, but the faithful presence with them of someone who really cares about them as a person. It's the with they desperately want. And the for on its own, whether it's food or presence or money, can't make up for the lack of that with. But we all fear the with, because the with seems to ask more of us than we can give. We'd all prefer to keep charity on the level of four, where it can't hurt us. We all know that more families struggle over Christmas than any other time. Maybe that's because you can spend the whole year being busy and doing things for your family, but when there's nothing else to do but be with one another, you realize that being with is actually harder than doing for, and sometimes it's just too hard. Sometimes New Year comes as a relief as we can go back to doing for and leave aside being with for another year. And that's why it's glorious, almost incredible good news that God didn't settle on for. God said unambiguously, I am with. Behold, my dwelling is among you. I've moved into the neighborhood. I will be with you always. My name is Emmanuel, God with us. Sure, there was an element of for in Jesus' life. He was for us when he healed and taught. He was for us when he died on the cross. He was for us when he rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. These are things that only God can do and we can't do. But the power of these things God did for us lies in that they were based on God's being with us. God has not abolished for but God in becoming flesh in Jesus has said there will never again be a for that's not based on a fundamental, unalterable, everlasting, and utterly unswerving with. That's the good news of the incarnation. And how do we celebrate this good news? By being with people in poverty and distress even when there's nothing we can do for them by being with people in grief and sadness and loss even when there's nothing to say, by being with and listening to and walking with those we find most difficult rather than trying to fob them off with a gift or a face-saving gesture, by being still with God in silent prayer rather than rushing in our anxiety to do yet more things for God by taking an appraisal of all our relationships and asking ourselves, does my working for arise out of a fundamental commitment to be with, or is my working for driven by my profound desire to avoid the discomfort, the challenge, the patience, the loss of control involved in being with? No one could be more tempted to retreat into doing for than God. God, above all, knows how exasperating, ungrateful, thoughtless, and self-destructive company we can be. Most of the time, we just want God to fix it and spare us the relationship. But that's not God's way. God could have done it all alone, but God chose not to. God chose to do it with us, even though it cost the cross. That's the amazing news of the word with. Let's think about the cross for a moment in the light of what we've seen about the word with. The cross is usually portrayed as the ultimate moment of for, the definitive thing only God could do that God did do on our behalf. In fact, the cross is Jesus' ultimate demonstration of being with us. But in the cruelest irony of all time, it's the instant Jesus finds that neither we nor the Father are with him. Remember Jesus' agonizing words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every aspect of being not with, of being without, clusters together at the foot of the cross. Jesus experiences the reality of human sin because sin is fundamentally living without God. Jesus experiences the depth of suffering because suffering is more than anything the condition of being without comfort. Jesus experiences the horror of death because death is the word we give to being without all things, without breath, without connectedness, without consciousness, without a body. 
Jesus experiences the biggest alienation of all, the state of being without the Father and thus being not God, being for this moment without the with that is the essence of God. Jesus gives everything that he is for the cause of being with us, for the cause of embracing us within the essence of God's being. He's given so much, even despite our determination to be without him, and yet he's given beyond our imagination because for the sake of our being with the Father, he has for this moment lost his own being with the Father. And the Father has longed so much to be with us that he has for this moment lost his being with the Son, which is the essence of his being. Here we are at the central moment in history. Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, has to choose between being with the Father or being with us. And he chooses us. At the same time, the Father has to choose between letting the Son be with us or keeping the Son to himself and he chooses to let the Son be with us. Can you believe it? That is the choice on which our eternal destiny depends. That's the epicenter of the Christian faith and our very definition of love. Let's return to the English patient. Remember, we left Laszlo choosing whether to stay beside Catherine or walk to Cairo in search of assistance. What does he do? He scarcely thinks twice before he sets off on his three-day journey to find help. He has all sorts of adventures before he finally makes it back to the encampment and the ancient cave. And when he does, Catherine is very, very very dead. Laszlo's so committed to believing that there's a solution to Catherine's agonizing plight and that he has that solution, that he overlooks the only thing that matters, and that is being with Catherine. He's so concerned to solve the problem that he leaves her alone in her hour of greatest need. I wonder whether the real reason Laszlo went to Cairo was because he couldn't bear to watch Catherine die. I wonder whether we fill our lives with activity and creativity and productivity because we fear if we sat still, we'd go to pieces. What Catherine needed was the man she loved to be with her as she faced the near certainty of her own impending death, but Laszlo didn't or maybe couldn't give her what she needed. We're turning our world into a Laszlo society, full of products, full of gadgets, full of devices, full of techniques, full of energy, all of which make the world go round very effectively, and the result is that we've all become Laszlo we'd all walk to Cairo rather than stay with Catherine, wouldn't we? And yet, the story twists on a profound irony. When Laszlo, returning to Cairo with Catherine's body, crashes another plane and is himself horribly injured, he's found and tenderly accompanied by strangers and cared for until the point of his death. He receives from strangers at the end of his life the patient love he wasn't able to give to Catherine at the end of hers. Here lies the defining question of our time. Are we going to give in to our society's pressure always to be Laszlo? Or are we going to imitate the Christ of manger and crucifixion, the God 
who is with us always, even to the end of time? Are we going to configure every relationship as a safe one in which we can work for? Or are we, like God, going to risk the terrifying intimacy of being with. Amen.